Hey everyone, this is Lynn Bartim, and you are listening to the Apex Hour on KSUU Thunder 91.1. In this show, you get more personal time with the guests who visit Southern Utah University from all over, learning more about their stories and opinions beyond their presentations on stage. We will also give you some new music to listen to and hope to turn you on to some new sounds and new genres. You can find us here every Thursday at 3 p.m. or on the web at seu.edu slash apex. But for now, welcome to this week's show here on Thunder 91.1. Right, everyone. Well, welcome into the show this week. It's such a pleasure to be here. We are celebrating February and we are talking about such an interesting topic. Well, we're talking about sports history and sports culture in general today. Um, and I'm really excited to get into it a little bit more. Our guest today is Richard Ian Kimball, Dr. Kimball, who is an associate professor at BYU University. Welcome into the studio, Richard. Hi, it's great to be here. It's so great to have you here. Um, Richard did his talk earlier today, and it was all about, we we sort of build it as deaf culture in sports. Um, But I'd love to just get into it a little bit more and and just uh, talk to Richard about what it is you do at BYU and what your areas of expertise are. Well, first I teach uh, American cultural history. Cool. So most of that means I teach a class in sports history. Right. And- then I also teach a large GE course called American Heritage, which is required of nearly every student, which is a class about the Constitution. It's kind of a civics-based course, and so it's a large lecture course. So I get you know everything from the small seminars with five or six students to the huge auditoriums with 800 and 66 students or something like that. That's amazing. I mean, what's it like to teach 800 students? I mean, it's like you have a huge audience every week. It is. And there's a lot of a lot of energy in the room. Oh, that's so cool. It's kind of fun. Yeah. It but it 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 must be I've never really performed in a play, but it must be like a performance cuz you're, you're really drained afterwards. Yes. But it's uh it's an important class, yeah. a class that I believe in, yeah. things that need the students need to understand. And so I think it's a pretty good gig. Yeah, cool. And as a writer, you have two major publication full books and then many articles, and I'm really excited to talk to you about them. But I wonder if you could just give us a thumbnail about your two books, um, both of which I picked up today uh, and just I'm really excited to read. My first book, Sports in Zion, grew out of my uh, dissertation. Mm-hmm. And so it's about sort of Mormon recreation is the subtitle, but it's really about if I had to do it over again, I would have titled it muscular Mormonism. Oh, It's about how the LDS church used activities, boy scouts, all these ways to socialize young people into the church. Not, I mean, I, mean, I think there is a theological element to sort of the you know, the play spirit in Mormon history. Yeah. But this was by design, right? Uh, Programs yeah. that were meant to keep kids interested in the church. Right, right. And so that really came around the turn of the 20th century, 1890 to the Depression yeah. in that period. Well, actually, let me ask you a few more questions about that. So what um, what kinds of programs were there? I mean, we, we sort of know about the Boy Scouts and that kind of thing, but organized sports activities, um, What? how did that manifest itself for those of us who don't know anything about that? So sports is a big one. Mm-hmm. So organized sports, sports on the local level, so the ward or you know, sort of the parish level, and competitive between different areas, oh. it almost resembling how we high school sports today. Right. Okay. And this took place across the entire church. And then there would be an all church tournament. Oh wow! In, you know, say in basketball. Yeah. And so it really brought wards together, but it also kept young people interested in church things. Oh. So even if you weren't necessarily, you know, a real active member yeah. in the uh community, you know, in the in the ward say, 
at least you played basketball. And to play basketball, you'd have to live by a few rules, right? Oh. You, you couldn't, you know, break the word of wisdom by smoking. That was, if you did that, you were off the team. So in order to stay on the team, you'd have to live some principles. And then the idea is that they hope that that would then keep you attached to the church as you grew up. Oh, wow. So was it multiple sports or was it just kind of football and basketball or were there lots of different ones? All kinds of sports. Oh. Uh, no football that I, I don't recall, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not organized. Basketball, certainly. Softball. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to think it. I mean, those were the big ones. Yeah, the and, big. Uh -huh. You know, by the 1950s and 60s, the finals of these tournaments would be televised oh, on really? you know, local TV in Salt Lake. Oh, wow. So, And this is still something, the outgrowths of these, and these stopped really in the, I, I can't remember exactly the year, but in the early 70s. Yeah, that's what I wanted to know. When did it? Yeah, okay. And when the church really was, had grown worldwide. Right, okay. You know, far past the Wasatch uh, front. Mm -hmm. And was it essentially a Utah thing or did it sort of, ex was it in other states as, at all? It was, yeah. Wherever there was enough Mormons to put up a team, mm -hmm. put up good teams, mm -hmm. they would have regional tournaments, you know, f say from California, mm -hmm. um, especially, you know, where anywhere Mormons were. Yeah. And then they would come to Salt Lake for the big tournament. Oh, yeah. Finals. Like the big finals. Okay, cool. It, and how did that? How does that play out today? Do is, are there any remnants of it? Are there still sports within the 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 wards or within the different um, organizational structures? I think sports are still important, mm -hmm. but nothing like this massive church wide tournament. Yeah, I mean, I think that especially, I mean, that young men's and young women's groups will play basketball, sometimes competitively in the area, mm -hmm. but that's about as far as it goes. Yeah, yeah. And of course, I'm, one of the major things that came out of sort of the progressive period at the beginning of the 20th century was an attachment between the LDS Church and the Boy Scouts. Right. Which was, you know, long held. Yes, and still, and still an, very active. It was until a year or two ago. Oh, okay, okay. When the LDS Church left the Boy Scout oh, oh, okay. program. Okay, okay. And so that has been that's a remnant of the past. I now. see, I see. Okay. Yeah. So LDS wards don't sponsor troops anymore. And, oh. the, and the church isn't involved with the Boy Scouts. So that's been a major change. Yeah, that is. Okay. And um, but tell me a little bit about that progressive era when it came to be, um, when that connection started. So in the early twentieth century there had been a move toward urbanization. Mm -hmm. And there was a great concern that boys and girls were being ruined by the city, mm -hmm. that they were being made soft by the city, oh. right? They came from quote unquote pioneer stock, uh -huh. but now they're living soft. Oh. You know, they're working in retail. They don't. <laughs> and so it, this, you know, in the early 20th century, like in 1910, if I remember correctly, the Deseret Gym in Salt Lake City is built. I see, okay. And you move toward the Boy Scouts in order to give boys that hardening effect of being out in the wilderness, doing difficult things, uh -huh. getting away from the city, and sort of having almost a proxy pioneer experience in a Boy Scout unit. And for the young women, there was a concern about working women. Oh, right? So right. women had begun to take jobs, especially you know, in retail or secretarial work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were you know, falling prey to the problems in yeah. the city. Yeah. Yeah. And so in order to help them, they didn't have they didn't join the Girl Scout movement. Oh. Instead they started camps. Uh-huh. And so they built some fairly um, comfortable camps uh, in the canyons around Salt Lake City, uh -huh. where women could go and take a respite from the city oh. and refresh themselves, almost like, you know, not like a spa experience. It wasn't quite right. that bougie. Yeah. But it was a chance to be outside, return to nature. There was a thought, and I think that you can carry this through, there was a thought that you were closer to God 
in nature. I see. And the city was just, in some cases, literally a streetcar ride away. Oh. But you would still leave that all behind huh. and be refreshed. Wow, that's fascinating. So those are all kind of themes that sort of came out of your research in the sports and Zion movement. Um, one of the interesting things about it, that I was seeing about that book was, um, you know, these teaching of values that we've we've touched on, but also the the kind of the masculinity um, part of it was that sort of part of this whole movement as well to kind of. Um, we mentioned the pioneer thing, but sort of the, um, the, the being super manly with sports and these things, was that also part of it? Very much so. Mm. So beginning sort of in the post-Civil War period, there is a fear of fem that American society was being feminized, right. that girls were going to school with boys. Oh. Girls were starting to go to college with girls co-ed colleges, mm -hmm. and taking men's jobs, mm. right? Men used to hold retail jobs, oh. and they were taken by women. Uh -huh. And so men had to sort of retake some of something back because they had lost, they said anyway, yeah, whether right. this is real or not. Right, right. They had lost their masculinity. Huh. And so all of the, a lot of these efforts were, designed to keep people in the church, but also to remasculinize young men. And this isn't just in the LDS church, right? This is an American culture writ large. And right. so the movement toward football. Yeah. Yeah. The movement toward the Boy Scouts. Yeah. So all of these things take place at the same time right. and they're trying to um, overcome that feminization that they saw. Fascinating. Especially in churches. Yeah, fascinating. Interesting. It wasn't just a church thing, but it seems like something that uh, definitely uh, suited itself well to, to churches, as you were saying. Yeah, and I think it shows, you know, the LDS church moving more into the mainstream of American mm -hmm. thought, mm -hmm. right, and society, mm -hmm. where, you know, before, during the polygamy period, but Beginning in the 1890s, the church is moving toward that cultural mainstream, yeah. and I think this helps that. Fascinating. Well, thank you for that. It's already time for our first musical break, and um, when we get back, I definitely want to talk a little bit more about uh, the deaf football players and your talk today and get into some of the details of that. But I have a bunch of music to play for everyone, as always, and um, the first song that I'm going to play um, is called Remembering, um, and this is uh, by Avishi Cohen, and, and Avishi Cohen's playing with Mark Giuliana, great drummer, and um, anyway, it's just a, I've played Avishi Cohen in before this is a, a new album that I what new to me um, that has a more of a collaborative aspect to it and the song is called remembering you're listening to the apex hour KSUU Thunder 91.1 
All right. Well, welcome back, everyone, to the Apex Hour. That song is called Remembering. Um, the artist is Avishi Cohen, um, A-V-I-S-H-A-I, and then Cohen, C-O-H-E-N. You're listening to the Apex Hour at KSU Thunder 91.1. As always, if you're interested in any of the music, I have a very public playlist um, on Spotify called Played on Apex Hour, which you can just search. Um, it's Played on Apex Hour, created by Lynn Vartan. Or you can look at our website, which is www.scu.edu slash Apex. And uh, right on the podcast uh, tab, you'll find the link to the Spotify playlist. So enjoy. Um, We are in the studio with Richard Kimball, and we are talking about sports culture, um, sports history. uh, And now we're going to turn to a a bit of a a niche in sports history, which is um, deaf football players uh, and the emergence of uh, uh, deaf football players in the collegiate football realm. So welcome back, Richard. Thank you. It's great to be here. Okay, and so I'd love for you to sort of tell us kind of, um, you know, how this came to be for you. I know I asked you this earlier, but it's kind of a fun story to hear how you got involved in researching deaf football players. I knew nothing about this, and I was teaching a history of American sports class, require a research paper, and one of the students did her paper on deaf football players, and she reached into a a resource that uh, newspapers mm-hmm. that I, I was not aware of. And so uh, after she finished her paper, I said, this is a topic I'm really interested in and was seeing if she was going to pursue it and she wasn't interested. So I, it really piqued my curiosity. And once I got into it, I was stunned at how important, at least it seemed to me, football was to the deaf community, especially at Gallaudet College. I mean, so there were high schools for the deaf, schools for the deaf. Most states run a school for the deaf still. And football was a big part of those, especially at the turn of the 20th century. And I think that's the most interesting part because that's when football was beginning to become really popular in the United States. Yeah. Yeah. And deaf football was a, was a part of that. Yeah. So as it, it started to emerge in the U.S., then the, there was one school in particular that you mentioned, Gallaudet, that was kind of the center of it all. And uh, in, in your talk today, you sort of traced sort of the history of those teams. Can you give us a little bit of a snapshot of kind of how those teams started um, and, and, then, and then what happened with them? Well, and this is typical of how football started at many colleges in the 1870s and 80s. It grows from a variant of rugby and becomes American football. Slowly it evolves from the 1880s through the early um, 1900s. And just like at Yale or at Harvard, at Gallaudet College, which was the only college for the deaf in the United States, sort of the premier institution of higher education for deaf people, it took place much the same way. It was student-driven. The students learned about the game, and they brought some experts from other colleges. Often it was you know, the, the child of a faculty member at Gallaudet, mm-hmm. And they learned the game, and by 1883, they had they fielded their first full blown football team. That's so cool. So when they when they started, they kind of got got going, got got a sense of the rules and things like that. Um, but I I also really enjoyed in your talk that there was um, a little not so much more at stake for them, but there was more that they were trying to prove than just playing football. It seems like they were more invested in in um, other aspects of what it meant to play football. And I wonder if you could talk about that some. And this goes right along with the mascul- masculinization talk that we had right. earlier. It's happening at the same time. And it's happening in sort of the same ways for uh, deaf men. But there's more at stake here. Mm-hmm. Because beginning in the 1880s, there is a move toward oralism yeah. and against sign language among 
most deaf educators. So, yeah, I don't think I realized that. Why? Why was that? Do you know? Or well, so most of social commentators, and I mean, according to some early social science work on it, you know, the deaf were seen as exotic, as different, mm. but generally not in a good way. Right. Right. And so, you know, words like backwardness mm -hmm. and feeble-mindedness mm -hmm. because they couldn't communicate in an expected way mm -hmm. they were seen as intellectually stagnated right right yeah. and so football which was at that point at that time considered the quote-unquote scientific sport oh right was the perfect way for deaf men to prove their physical equality in a way that was accepted by mainstream America. Yeah, yeah. And so Gallaudet turns to it, and it. when we say it was more, it meant more at Gallaudet, was because not only were they playing the game like normally playing the game, but they were also playing the game to show that they were physically similar or even physically superior mm. to other teams. And they played big colleges. They mm -hmm. played Georgetown and Johns Hopkins and the University of Virginia. And when they beat them, it meant even more. Yeah. And so their, um, you know, their, their track record or their wins versus losses, um, I'd love to sort of talk about that a little bit and then also talk about what that meant. So were they always a winning team, sometimes a winning team, not usually a winning team? What was, what was their record like? Generally not a winning team. Mm -hmm. There were years where they were very successful. Mm -hmm. A couple of years at the turn of the century in 1899 and 1901, they had great years. Yeah. They won seven games and lost only two. In 1899, they beat the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Wow. I mean, that's a once-in-a-lifetime thing, yeah. and maybe a once-in-a-century thing. Yeah. As through the 20th century... They weren't extremely successful. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, they are playing hearing teams. Yeah, right. And so they are at, I, I would say, a distinct disadvantage. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so I think through they averaged you know, winning a third of their games mm -hmm. or so. Mm -hmm. I also wonder, I mean, they probably had fewer numbers in in the school just i mean so you, you know less to pull on from the team is that the case yes when it started you know in the 1880s and 1890s there were 70 students 70 male students in the whole school at the university yeah, wow right and most of them aren't interested right and the papers that covered deaf sports, right? There were deaf newspapers and also other newspapers like the New York Times that would cover deaf sports from time to time, mostly Gallaudet. Mm -hmm. But in the papers, it was a constant complaint from Gallaudet football captains that they were 30 pounds smaller, Ugh. that they were slower, yeah. that they had all of these disadvantages in addition to not being able to hear. Right. And still, the ability to even compete with hearing teams meant something. I think of one year um, when they played Navy. Mm -hmm. And, of course, deaf men couldn't join the Navy. Right. right. They're prohibited. Right. And being able to be on the same field with the U.S. Naval Academy, even when they lost, and they did, yeah. it was a victory yeah. for these deaf men. Yeah. And there's also something I think important, about, another thing important about Gallaudet University. It was the home of American Sign Language. Oh, uh, right. So it's the place where this oralism, this movement toward quote unquote normalization of deaf men and women is being countered. Uh -huh. And so that carried to the football field as well. So a victory for Gallaudet is a victory for the deaf, but it's also a victory for sign language. Wow. I mean, to be a fly on the wall after one of those victories, I bet it was just such a source of pride. Yeah, and when they, some, like when they beat the University of Virginia, they came home 
bonfires were roaring, poems are written. I mean, these are the, the phrase gods of the campus oh. was fit them perfectly. That's beautiful. And one of the things that I think was interesting, we were talking about your research and how you got this research. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, the power of these um, publications, these newspapers that are specifically uh, written for the deaf and, and, um, and maybe just talk about what you found there and, and talk about those. As a historian, it's a remarkable cache of sources that I was completely unaware of. There were newspapers at many of the state schools for the deaf. Uh, Gall Gallaudet College had a publication. Mm -hmm. And so there are voices in here, the voices of the deaf students who are running these often, right? right? Whether it's you know under the leadership of a a teacher, mm -hmm. but these college magazines cover football so in depth. It was clear that football was an important part of this community. I mean, so they just spoke loud and clear. And there's so many, it's such a great set of sources for anybody that would be interested in deaf history. And they're all available digitized by the Gallaudet archives okay. available online. Yeah. So anybody can kind of dig in and read them. Yeah. A couple of clicks. That's awesome. And what is the state of the Gallaudet team today and what kinds of things are they doing now? So they're still playing football. Yeah. They're still playing competitive intercollegiate football. They have had some excellent seasons. They've made the division three playoffs they typically don't, mm -hmm. but it's still alive and well, and it still serves much of the same purpose in uniting the deaf community. Gallaudet University is still the school for the deaf. It's not a big school, mm -hmm. but it does sort of, it is the place where a lot of progress is made for the deaf. And it's a great place to research. That's awesome. Well, cool. Thank you for sharing that. It's already time for our next musical break. Um, the next song that I have for you is called Morning Joy. Um, and the artist, uh, the, the is, again, it's a collaboration, a small um, kind of jazz combo group. But the artist who's the, t the top build artist on this is Manu Kache, who is a great drummer, very interesting drummer, very interesting musician. Um, yeah. And the song is called Morning Joy. You're listening to the Apex Hour, KSUU, Thunder 91.1.
All right. Well, that's just a great ending chord for that piece. I love it. I love how that one ends. Um, that song is uh, Morning Joy, and the artist is Manu Kache, K-A-T-C-H-E. Um, and again, you can find all this music on Spotify, uh, and there's a public playlist called Played on Apex Hour, uh, which is linked on our website, scu.edu slash apex. Um, welcome back to the Apex Hour. I am joined in the studio with Dr. Richard Kimball. Welcome back. Thank you. We have been talking about uh, deaf football players and how they sort of integrated into the college football scene um, at the turn of the century. And um, we sort of talk, we're talking about how, uh, how much was at stake for them, what they really were trying to achieve. And one of the things that occurred to me is, is that they were really on a quest for equality, you know, with their hearing um, counterparts. And I know that um, this quest for equality um, has has come up in your um, writings and your research. And it's something that you think about a lot and, and probably integrate into your classes. And that is the is equality in sports culture. And I wondered if you might comment about um, some of your thoughts and feelings about, um, we can start with race equality in sports culture today. Where do you think things are? Where do you think things are headed? What would you like to see? Um, what are your musings on the topic from your perspective? I think we're in a moment of where there's a real potential for change. Yeah. And that there are black athletes who can lead some of that change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think especially when we uh, talk about systemic racism. Right. And the quest for equality there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there have been in the past African-American athletes who have led the charge for equality, right? At certain spots. I mean, you can think of Muhammad Ali. Right. Or um, Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 68 Olympics. Mm -hmm. Bill Russell calling for equality. The work of Arthur Ashe. Right. But at, at this moment, it seems, at least to me, from my perch, that there are athletes like LeBron James, mm -hmm. Colin Kaepernick, okay. who have a similar potential to make change. But they have something else, too. They have huge social media followings. Right. They have lots of money. Yeah. <laughs> lots of corporate pull and cachet. And I think that they could be potentially the leaders of a new push. Yeah. That they could push it even farther where the NBA and the NFL have become such integral parts of American society. And those league they're and they're black leagues. Mm -hmm. I mean seventy to eighty percent of the players are black. Mm -hmm. That I think that there's a push to for equality within the sports themselves, mm -hmm. say in terms of black head coaches in the NFL, that's not going extremely well this year. Mm -hmm. I think I want to say one in seven, mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. of the seven openings was take was filled by a black head coach. Right. And so there are things to be done in the game, but there are also things to be done in the wider world. Yeah. Yeah. Where someone like LeBron James can really push for difference both in the corporate boardroom, mm -hmm. but also on the playground. Right, right. And we're seeing that a little bit, you know, already. And, and we were talking about how I love tennis and Formula One. And, you know, Naomi Osaka was very prominent in her uh, presence this past year and statements and Lewis Hamilton. So you see it maybe perhaps more coming from the inside out, from inside the sport, rather than something being dictated from the top. And I think, well, I see that it has to happen both ways, uh -huh. that the NBA and the NFL are part of the system right. that um, allows racism to continue in the United States. Right, right, right. And so there's that side, and then there's also the larger side, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? So you got to change the sport, and we got to change society. Yeah, And athletes can't do it by Alone, themselves yeah, right but i think that they can be great spokespersons for it 
And do you think the conversation in, in gender equality is the same or does it take on a different tact or um, is the, the way to handle it the same or do you see any differences there? I think that there are um, interesting combinations there because in, in a lot of ways, when you think about gender equality in sports terms, a lot of the athletes are African American and women. Yeah, right. And so the the movement toward equality, I think, has it, it's maybe it's more complex. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that in terms of you know, since in wider sports participation, you know, with the advent of Title Nine, yeah. And the increase, and if you're on any college campus, I mean, the amount, at least it's not even close to being equal right. at all, especially when you throw football in the mix. Right. But that women's teams have a much larger presence on campus than they did 10 years ago. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been a big advance. Mm -hmm. You know, and inside sports, there's uh, there's been that call for equality. I'm not sure. I'm just not educated enough. Mm. I don't see as big a role being played by female athletes mm -hmm. in broader society, but I, I could be persuaded otherwise. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's just interesting to get your perspective on it. Um, so with, with sports culture, I know that there's, there's so many things to celebrate about it and there's so many things to lament about it. And I wondered, I don't know if this is a strange question or not. I wonder if there's something um, in your studies that you really um, celebrate about sports culture. It could be historical or modern. And if there was the single thing that if you had the power to change, you would change, what would, what would that be? So what's the thing you love the most or, or sort of want to celebrate the most? from your perspective, and then what would be the one thing you would want to change right now if you could, like snap your fingers? I think that April 15th, even though it's tax day, <laughs> should be a national holiday. That's the day that, in 1947, that Jackie Robinson um, broke the color barrier, for lack of a better yeah. term, uh, in Major League Baseball. I think that should be a celebrated. Day. That's beautiful. I don't know that it's going to go anywhere, but. Um, we'll start the movement here. Yeah, I think he, for me, he is a true American hero. Wow. And I think that a lot of the, I think of the players who integrated sports mm -hmm. or reintegrated sports in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s um, should be celebrated. Mm. I mean, we lost uh, Henry Aaron last week. Right, right. And he's one that uh, every kid should read books about. Mm. And if I was czar for a day. Yeah, what would what be the would thing? Like if you could snap your fingers and make this thing better about sports and sports culture. What I would do is I would go back to the 19th century model of coaching and playing sports. So a coach would be able to coach you or train you during the week, teach you principles. But when you were out on the court or out on the field, you were on your own. And I think they talk about sports as being character building. Yeah. I tend to think they're more character revealing. Oh. But if we, I think that there's a possibility to build character if the, players on the f court field had to call their own plays. We're in charge of you know, what was happening there Yeah, to return it, to move the game. Like now when you hear advertisements for college basketball or football, it's always Mike Shashevsky, the coach and the Duke blue devils or, yeah. um, and I think that we should take the coach we, move the coach back and move the players in front. Yeah. In addition to paying them, taking care of them. Yes. Recognizing yeah. that they have, you know, that they're, 
um, at least employees of the university. Yeah. Yeah. I really love that because you think about the additional expressions of leadership, of camaraderie, of recognizing um, strengths and qualities in your fellow players and uh, how you can boost each other up. I think that would just be even, I'm sure that's happening, but it would just be even stronger to see those happening today. That's really cool. Well, I like that. Let's make you czar for a day. (laughs) I'd have a long list of other things, too. (laughs) That's just the top of it. Well, in the few minutes that we have left, I wanted to make sure to get back. We mentioned your your, uh, earlier book, Sports in Zion, but you have a newer book um, that's uh, 2017, I think, um, Legends Never Die, The Afterlives of Athletes in Modern America. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that book and um, just share a little bit of a synopsis or what is that book about? So the idea behind that book is to look at what happens when athletes die young. Ah. So it's about the death of young athletes, mostly young. Dale Earnhardt's in there and he was he was pushing fifty. That that's yeah, that's the new young. It's a new forty. Yeah. And so and the idea it was that Athletes live on because we need them to live on. That What do you mean by that? that? Fans mm. and family members in some cases create stories, narratives that keep the athlete alive so they have an afterlife. And it's often to and it I think it speaks I hope it speaks to beyond just sports. But the idea that we need to feel immortal uh, in some way, yeah. You know, sort of how we deal with death in these cases is, you know, take the example of Lane Frost, mm-hmm. who was a rodeo star, a uh, bull rider, who's killed at uh, Cheyenne Frontier Days. I want to say 1987, but his family, upon after his death turned him into sort of a Christian hero, Mm. right? Creating, you know, Bibles, Lane Frost Bibles. I didn't know that. That he was, you know, a cowboy for Christ, those sorts of things. Um, And so, especially when young athletes die, we need an explanation. Yeah. Right? And we often will say, you know, he died doing what he loved. Right. Or, you know, God needed a second baseman or yeah, something like right, that. Yeah, right, right. We've heard that, yeah. And so it's ways that we, as Americans particularly, deal with death. Mm-hmm. And it's often, uh, it deals with religion, but it's also, it's often commodified. Right. I see. Well, that's really uh, amazing. And so the book, does it does it go from player to player? Does it talk about it more topically? How is it laid out? So it, it's laid out sort of case studies. Oh, okay. So there is a chapter on Lane Frost. There's a chapter on Bonnie McCara. Well, and it's actually two parts of the same chapter. So what happens when a male rodeo athlete dies and in the years after Lane Frost's death, uh, rodeo and especially bull riding went through the roof, right? Uh, with yeah. The, with the yeah, pro bull yeah. riders tour and all that. Yeah. You know, the movie Eight Seconds. Right. Oh, Luke yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And so that's um, in the same chapter as the story of Bonnie McCarroll, uh-huh. who was also a rodeo star in uh-huh. the 1920s. Uh-huh. And she's killed uh, during a ride. And then women's rodeo after that is go you know falls off the map uh, wow. and doesn't and it really hasn't been yeah hasn't resumed yet interesting you know, in terms of rough stock events and so you know one goes one way the other goes the other fascinating yeah. oh that's really interesting yeah. I never really thought about that and I wonder if the gender role plays into that it it certainly did yeah and so you know it's that's when women are moved away from rough stock events Mm. and now you know into more roping and 
rodeo queen yeah, right, sorts right, of things. Right. And it's a clear move. Yeah. Um, that, Interesting. Yeah, it just wasn't good for, they thought, yeah. for the reputation yeah. of rodeo generally. Makes sense. Wow, fascinating. Well, the book is titled Legends Never Die, The Afterlives of Athletes in Modern America. And then the other book that we mentioned, the earlier book, is Sports in Zion. Um, and we've been speaking with Richard Ian Kimball today. We are amazingly pretty much out of time. I have one last question that I always ask everyone. And that's more just a fun one. It's kind of, um, you know, what's turning you on this week? And it can be Anything. It, it's just a sort of a little snapshot. Some people say a book they're reading or a movie they're watching or a TV show. We've had people say like a, you know, a lipstick that they love or a food that they're really into or a drink that they're really into or whatever. It's just kind of uh, whatever just comes to mind is something that's really turning you on this week. So, Dr. Kimball, what is turning you on this week? Oh, can I do a plug? Sure. I listened to uh, on the way down here uh, the Culture Gab Fest ah. from Slate dot com. Okay, and so it it's all things culture. They have three really smart critics, and it's a it's a great hour. So, so it's a is it a, a podcast? It, it's a podcast. Or, okay, so Slate dot com has a podcast, and it's called the Culture. The, the Culture Gab Fest, if I remember right. Gab Fest, the Culture Gab Fest. And it's just all things culture and... So books, TV, movies, music. I love it. And they're all smart. And so, and they come from different points of view. So it's a good hour. That sounds fantastic. Okay, well, thank you for that. Well, I really appreciate your time and all of your sharing. Thanks so much for being here. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you. You're very welcome. It's been great. Awesome. Well, that was Dr. Richard Kimball, everyone. And um, with that, we will sign off and I will see you next week on the Apex Hour. Thanks so much for listening to the Apex Hour here on KSUU Thunder 91.1. Come find us again next Thursday at 3 p.m. for more conversations with the visiting guests at Southern Utah University and new music to discover for your next playlist. And in the meantime, we would love to see you at our events on campus. To find out more, check out suu.edu slash apex. Until next week, this is Lynn Vartan saying goodbye from the Apex Hour here on Thunder 91.1.